first let us do cardinality since that came up first. So uh, here is a set of student roll numbers and here is a set of courses. So now each student is mapped to the courses that they have taken. So now how many uh, students could be mapped to a course? Is there any limit? Maybe an upper limit but surely there can be multiple. Now how about students? Can are students required to take only one course? They can take multiple courses. In this case, uh, this student has taken two courses. So what can you say about this relationship? Many, yeah, it's a many to many. Okay, so um, each student can be mapped to many courses. Each course can be mapped to many students. So that's many to many. That's one type of cardinality <laughs> relationship. So this relationship in this case is the registers for relationship between student and course and student has a roll number course has a course code and you can have grades here so the question here was cardinality and that is covered in this slide so the cardinality is number of participating elements in the set a uh, one to one can you give an example of a one to one relationship student to hostel uh, that's actually uh, many to one when you take student to hostel Many students can be mapped to one hostel. Hostel and room number. Okay. Uh, in IIT, students share rooms, so <laughs> it's still not one. <laughs> but let's say that uh, each student has only one room, or, or you have two of you are sharing a room here, right? Let's pretend you all got individual rooms. Then it would be one to one, uh, person to room. Um, many to many, we just saw. And many to one, one to many, it just depends on. It's the same thing, it depends how you look at it. So if you take uh, u to room numbers, it is um, what? No. From u course participants to room number, it is many to one. Okay. So many of you can be mapped to one room, um, but each of you can be mapped to at most one room. So two may share a room, but one cannot have two rooms. Okay? So if you look for participant to room, it is many to one. Or if you look from room to participant, it is one to many, but it's not many to many. Um, and you saw how to convert uh, ER relationship into tables. Did, did you cover this? Yeah. Okay. So this is the corresponding table, student, uh, roll number, course code, and grade. Uh, as this slide says, um, in our uh, database example, we use customer name as the identifier, but in reality, we would not do that. That would be a customer ID. So that is a super key. Now, did you see candidate keys? Yeah? So a candidate key is just a super key which is minimal. You don't have extraneous things. Yeah, sure, customer ID plus phone number is unique. But then customer ID itself is unique. So why add on phone number unnecessarily? So it's minimal. And then primary key is something which you choose as the unique way of identifying something in here. So the customer ID, the branch ID, and so on are the unique identifiers, which are chosen as the primary key. In these notations, what is the difference between that small r and the capital R? What are the um, So in the book, we uh, tend to distinguish between the relation schema and the relation instance. So we use capital R to denote the schema, that is the attributes in the relation, whereas the instance is the actual table with the rows in it. Um, small i is the actual instance. Small, right, right. Um, but if you see in the real world, people uh, fudge this all the time. It's very clear from the context what you mean, whether you mean the relation schema or the relation instance. Um, so in, in the real world, it, you, we don't, most people don't care. They just use the same name. And from the context, you know whether they are talking of the schema or the actual set of rows. And a foreign key is an attribute of a table which corresponds to, uh, in, in, at least in SQL, the foreign key has to refer to a primary key of another table. Conceptually, what is a foreign key? It is an attribute in this table which must appear in the other table. And at least in the SQL version of primary key, uh, foreign key, this value must appear as the primary key of the other table. So what does that guarantee? It guarantees that you cannot have junk data here. 
So if you had a branch table with branch ID, and then for a policy you have a branch ID. If you did nothing, I can throw any value into branch ID in that policy. It need not correspond to an actual branch, but that is dirty data. You don't want that. You want it to be a valid branch. Therefore, what you do is introduce a foreign key. So pictorially it's shown here in this schema diagram as a arrow. So here are several foreign keys. Account has a branch name. And this arrow says that it is a foreign key into branch. So this ensures the data. So this is a diagrammatic thing. You can declare it in SQL as we will see. Once it's declared, the database ensures that any value which is stored in this column of any row must appear also in the branch name attribute of a some row of branch. Similarly, uh, in depositor, account number is a for, oops, account number is a foreign key to this, while customer name is a foreign key here. Similarly, for borrower. Similarly, here branch name of loan is a foreign key. Okay, so this is the diagrammatic notation. And in SQL, skipping these, let me go to the part where we declare these keys. Uh, so the table create table syntax is all right. You used it also. Yep. So over here we have just declared the attribute names, but in fact you can declare integrity constraints, of which primary and foreign keys are two types of integrity constraints. So here is an example here. No two customers can have the same customer ID number. This you enforce as a primary, by a primary key because you have chosen the customer ID to be the primary key. The primary key declaration enforces <laughs> this. The second one is what we just saw. The branch name attribute of the account relation must contain a value corresponding to an actual branch in the branch relation. So this is a foreign key. Uh, there are also not null. The at amount attribute for loan cannot be null. What is null? It's a special value indicating the values unknown. And obviously, you do not want an account whose um, uh, or a loan whose amount is null. It means I have a loan. I have no idea how much I loan. This is crazy. You cannot have it in real life. So you're insisting that you don't allow that value. Of course, that doesn't prevent someone from entering a garbage value, um, but we assume that this at least alerts them to this fact. So in SQL, um, there are primary key and foreign key declarations. So here is this same branch table, which we saw before create table branch, branch name, city assets, and we also add a primary key branch name. You can add all the integrity constraints at the end. Um, so here is customer with primary key customer name. And as we saw before, is customer name as primary key realistic? Not really. So really you would use customer ID. And coming to referential integrity, this is the foreign key. So we'll skip to this slide. Create table account, primary key account number. That part is required. Now foreign key branch name references branch. So this part is the attribute name locally. The attribute name here is branch name. So foreign key, this branch name references, this is the name of a table, branch. Which attributes of the table does it reference? Well, the primary key attribute. Here there is a single a thing which is the branch name, which is the primary key. In the schema you will use for exercises, instead of branch name, we have branch ID. So it's the same. So you'll have branch ID references branch. This is a foreign key branch name hmm. must appear as a primary key with the same name into the branch or with the yeah. name um, So uh, you can actually specify a mapping of names over there. If you don't do anything, it would, I think it is required to be the same name. Uh, although it can infer, if it's just a single column, even if it's a different name, you're just saying that the value here must be present as a primary key, primary key. Uh, attribute over there. But if there are two columns, then it obviously is not so clear. Uh, so you can actually list it. You can say a branch name, comma, something, references branch, and then open bracket, you can explicitly list the primary key. And the ordering can be explicitly defined. So branch name corresponds to maybe B name there while the next attribute of the foreign key corresponds to that other one. Otherwise, you don't know. AB may correspond to CD there, or AB may correspond to DC there. That mapping you can explicitly specify over here. We have not shown it here, but you can do that. Uh, 
but generally you will do it like this. This makes sense to use the same name. And depositor has two different foreign keys. Account number references account and customer name references customer. And the other integrity constraints are not null, which we saw. Unique, which specifies that the attributes together guarantee a unique value. It's a candidate key, right? Uh, and they are allowed to be null. No restrictions on that. Whereas primary key attribute values are not allowed to be null. Once you say it's primary key, nulls are not allowed. Uh, you can even have a check constraint where you put in any predicate you wish, uh, balance greater than 0, for example. So SQL supports a variety of integrity constraints. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so uh, what does it mean if a foreign key is null? Supposing that I have an account, um, but I don't know which branch it is. Okay, is that acceptable? Well, you may say that it's not. Somebody else may say, yeah, it's acceptable. If it has a branch, it must be a valid branch. Otherwise, it can be null. So you want to have this flexibility. So in fact, what happens in the foreign key is when you declare it as a foreign key, that does not say it is not null. It is perfectly fine to have nulls for all those values. Uh, if you do, all of them must be null. Uh, but if it's not null, then it must correspond to an actual valid thing. If you do not wish to allow nulls there, say that. Okay, so you saw the create table comment. There's a corresponding drop table, alter table. Um, alter table, you can add a column or drop a column. Although the drop column does not work on many databases. So you have to drop the table and create it afresh. Um, if you try this on your system, sometimes it will object to this. If you have a foreign key into a table and then you drop the table, what does that mean? You have a foreign key into a non-existing table. So then the system will say, sorry, I can't do that. There is a constraint which refers to this table. And then there are different actions you can take. You can say uh, drop table cascade, which means any foreign key which references this table is wiped out. The foreign key clause is also deleted, dropped. If you don't specify cascade, the drop table will fail. You can try that out uh, today if you want. Uh, create your own tables and then drop them. Um, as I said, you can add and drop attribute. So you can alter table R, add the name of the attribute and the type, just as in the create table. And uh, just to round off the data types, you saw the basic data types yesterday, <laughs> int and where care and so forth. Did you see the data types? Yes, sir. Okay, good. The interval type? Yes. Okay. Good. How to extract year, date, and so forth. Large object types? Okay, good. So that ends day one. Let's come back to day two now. Okay, now coming back to more basic stuff, uh, we saw that certain things which are the results of arithmetic expressions, aggregate expressions don't have a meaningful name. If you want to give it a name, you can do that. You can say uh, something as something. So you can see this query, select customer name, borrower loan number, amount times, well, it was 10, I guess amount times 10 as new amount. Okay, so in the output table, this column will have the name new amount. So that is one example of the as clause. In fact, um, in many databases, you can even drop the keyword as. Yeah, so yeah, you can just give that and that still works. Although I would recommend using it the as if the database supports it. Some databases are funny. They will not allow you to use as. Oracle, for example. Oracle. This kind of renaming can also be used for other things. Here we have what are called tuple variables, where you are giving a new name not to the output in the select clause, but rather to something in the from clause. So take this query. Find the names of all branches that have greater assets than some branch located in the city. This is, let's say, city, branch city in Powhai. Um, let's pretend Powai is a city. 
so here how do you do this you want to find branches which have greater assets than some other branch so you are comparing two branches the second branch must be in powai and the first branch must have a greater assets for it to be output so we write the query as follows we have two occurrences of branch in the query but now we have to give it a new name otherwise you don't know which one you are referring to if i say a branch dot assets which branch this one or this one so if you have two occurrences of the same relation you must give them new names using this branch as t branch as s okay s and t can be anything in fact in oracle you can drop the s in fact you are not allowed to use the s in oracle so you'll have to say branch t branch s with a, just a space so what this has done is this copy of branch has been named as t this copy of branch has been named as s so now i can say t dot assets greater than s dot assets and s dot branch city equal to powai so s is restricted to branches in powai and i'm selecting distinct t dot branch name where the assets of t are greater than s so all the names of all branches that have greater assets than some one branch at least located in powai is this query clear this illustrates the use of uh, these things these are called tuple variables uh, Uh, yes that is perfectly possible so it can if you have two branches of powai with distinct assets the higher one will show up for sure right so let me repeat the question for the others the question was supposing there is a branch which assets let's say 1 million and there are two branches in powai with assets of 500000 and 300000 so if you take the cross product here so like uh this is a standard sql query so it's always a cross product first conceptually so every branch is combined with every other branch now what is the condition here t dot assets greater than s dot assets so if you take these pairs uh, that let's say we have a hiranandani branch and uh, and uh, not hiranand let's say uh, some something else in worli and that has more assets than iit powai branch as well as another branch in powai so that branch in the cross product will be combined with both of these that branch in t will come up the cross product will have the combinations with these two if you check the condition here t dot assets greater than s dot assets it will be true for both those pairs and s dot branch t is powai will be satisfied for both these so that t will appear twice in the result and that is why we have done a select distinct to remove those duplicates so you can use this uh, tuple variables anywhere you want sometimes it's useful to avoid long relation names so in this case we have said borrower as t loan as s and now you can say t dot loan number s dot loan number instead of typing the whole borrower dot and loan dot you have to exclude powai branches if you have if you have to exclude powai branches then what would you do under tr branch city not equal to powai branch correct yeah you can add that if you want to eliminate things which are not in powai uh, which are in powai rather you can say t dot uh, branch city not equal to powai not equal to is extremely equal to or not less than greater than not uh, try it out the it less than greater than is fine uh, but databases may support not equal also so i think it's then mentioned in one of the slides earlier arithmetic operations so you to look up mm. no it's not here. it's not shown here but anyway it's it you will find it in the textbook it's not in this set of slides wrap up this slide as i said the key as is optional um maybe this is a point to try a few of these queries because we do have some time okay so here are all the branches with assets the branch cities here are mumbai chennai 
Kolkata and so on. Let's write that query. Um, select um, t dot branch name from branch t branch s where t dot assets greater than s dot assets and s dot branch city equals and we going to have any results oh, what is a mumbai has these two so this one in chennai should come out come on network okay uh Wait, how did we get all of these? Mm, let's look at the table again. It does not work. Oh, the, the, the type it separately. Okay. Clear up. Okay, Mumbai has thirty thousand. Where did we get all of those? Yeah, but Mumbai had just the one branch. So T dot assets greater than S dot assets. Yeah, there is a cross product. Then you will find all those which, which are greater than some s, where the s must be in Mumbai. Oh, here, sorry, I I didn't see the first one. This guy, Purani Haveli in Mumbai, is the lowest, ten thousand. Uh, the only one which is not there is which is not greater is this fellow. That Purani Haveli itself, we said greater than. So that and this don't match. Okay, so now let's uh, do Kolkata. Now that is twenty thousand. Uh, well, even then everything will have something in there. So all of them will appear. Uh, I didn't do the distinct, which is why you saw the repetition. Um, so Powai comes twice. Ignapur comes twice. So if I did a distinct. Okay, so all these branches. Any questions? So, Kolkata has just the one branch with twenty thousand. So all of these, Ignapur, Sion, and Powai, these are the three which have greater assets than some branch in Kolkata. Okay, so now let's move into a new topic, which is nested subqueries. So this is a different way of writing a query, in which is actually nested within the where clause, and you use this for a variety of reasons. Um, you can use it to check if something is contained in another set. Uh, you can do set comparison. We'll see examples of what this means. So, here's a query: find all customers who have both an account and a loan at the bank. We saw how to do this before, right? How was it? No, no. For both an account and an intersection. Okay, so that is one way of doing it. Now, here is another way of doing it. Select distinct customer name from borrower, where 
customer name in select customer name from depositor. So what is this in clause doing? The in clause takes a value and sees if it is in a set. Now what is this subquery here? Select customer name from depositor. What is it going to return? It's, it's going to return a set of names which are there in depositor. So now I'm going to take names, customer names from borrower, and if it also is there in the depositor customer names here, then it is output. So the next query is find all customers who have a loan but do not have an account. How do you check for? Do not have an account. Not in. Okay, so here is uh, from borrower you get customer names. So those are the people who have a loan. Where customer name not in, select customer name from depositor. Um, you can actually say uh, in the SQL standard, I'm not sure if PostgreSQL supports, I think it does. You can say open bracket, customer name, comma, some other attribute in, and then the select clause can say select customer name, comma, something. So you can have a. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, here. here. You can have two attributes yeah. within brackets. And here you can just list them, select customer name, comma, something. Yeah. So that was not there in SQL initially, it was added later. So you can try it out in PostgreSQL to see if it supports it. By the way, do you know where to look for, uh, if you're using PostgreSQL, you know where to look for documentation? Yeah, the home site for PostgreSQL.org. If you search on the thing, you'll find the documentation. Uh, look for the appropriate version of PostgreSQL. Uh, I think we are using 8.1, if I'm not mistaken. The current one is 8.3. What is set up uh, for you here? I don't know which one it is. It's 8 point something. Anyway, there's not too much difference between 8.0123, minor differences in terms of SQL features. So if you look up the PostgreSQL 8.0 documentation, that should be good. Good question. How do you choose which one to use? So the, um, the logic behind SQL, the, the idea behind SQL is that there may be more than one way. It is the job of the database to figure out the best way of executing, regardless of how you specify it. That's the idea behind SQL. Now, actual implementations do go to a good extent towards this ideal, but they may not always reach it. In particular, for example, with nested subqueries like this, PostgreSQL will actually transform this into something similar to the other one internally. I won't tell you that, but internally it will do more or less the same execution whether you give it like this or you do the uh, accept or the intersect. However, if this subquery is more complex, uh, PostgreSQL will not be able to figure this out. So sometimes you'll find this is inefficient, whereas if you had written it as intersect or accept, that will be a lot more efficient. Okay. So nested subqueries are very useful, but sometimes they can lead to very poor performance, especially on PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL is particularly bad because its optimizer doesn't, is not very clever on these things. Other databases, uh, the commercial databases are better in this respect. They are able to do quite a nice job, especially SQL Server is very good at handling optimizing nested subqueries. However, for simple ones, PostgreSQL is equally good. So the ones we are looking at are mostly fairly simple. So here is another one. Uh, customers who have both an account and a loan at the Perry Ridge branch, again you could do it by intersect. or Subquery. So this answers the question which you had. Can you give multiple ones? You can write this in many different ways. This is just one way of doing it. In fact, this is a more confusing way than the other one. It's probably a lot easier to write this way at intersect. But just to illustrate the features, what have we done here? Uh, customers who have both an account and a loan at Perry Ridge. So first look at the logic. You need to know the branch uh, name, which is Perry Ridge. You need to know the customer name. They are in two tables. So we have to join the two tables. The, uh, so the, for the loan, you have to join borrower and loan. For the account, you have to join 
depositor and account. So, there are two sets of joins to be done. So, this part um, says uh, select this thing, we will come to that part later. So, from borrower loan, where borrower dot loan number equal to loan dot loan number. So, that is the join to uh, get all the related attributes together with only matching rows. We also want to restrict it to the Perry Ridge branch, both the account and the loan must be at Perry Ridge. So, we also say uh, branch name equal to Perry Ridge, that is uh, guaranteed here. So, this part is clear, this gives you all uh, uh, borrower loan matching pairs from Perry Ridge. Now, we want to find customers who also have an account at Perry Ridge. So, what we have done is and branch name comma customer name in this query gets you all depositor account pairs which match, match on account number. Okay. So, from we are selecting branch name customer name. So, if this is in this, then that means this particular customer, the branch name is Perry Ridge here because we already equated that. If it is satisfied, then clearly that customer has an account at Perry Ridge because here the branch name is Perry Ridge. Therefore, that customer can be output, select distinct, removes duplicates. As I said, can be written in a much simpler manner but here we have just used it to illustrate this feature. Okay. So, now uh, you can also use nested subqueries to do these sorts of things, set comparison. Find branches that have greater as such than some branch located in Powai, Brooklyn, whatever. Here we are using Brooklyn. Same query which we saw before, right? Uh, by there, what did we do? We did a join of a table with itself. Uh, uh, yeah, it is actually a, not an equality condition. We had the greater than condition. You can write that like this. Uh, wait, this, this was the one we saw. You can write it like this. So, select branch name from branch where assets greater than sum. So, this is a special clause. Greater than sum means there is something in there which is greater than. Um, select assets from branch where branch city equal to Brooklyn. Now, between this and this, which one would you use? If you wrote this query, which is more readable, first of all? First one, first one is more readable? Okay, that is a matter of personal preference. <laughs> to me, the second one is more readable. Here you are doing ST, greater SS, what is going on, there is no equality condition here. You expect a joint to have equality. You start wondering, is this query correct? What does it mean? Whereas here, it is lot more clear. Select this from branch, where assets greater than some thing in this set. Okay, so, this is more directly mapping to this thing. So, you read this English query and this query. The matching is very close, whereas between this English query and this, the matching is not so obvious. Okay, so, as a programmer, you may prefer to write it like this. There is less chance of making mistakes. Uh, good question. How come we have not shown this thing there? Does it matter? Will Can there be duplicates? Think for a moment and tell me. We have assumed that branch name is a primary key for branch. So, now, can there be duplicates? We are not doing the cross product. What we are doing is, we take a particular branch and see if it is greater than some something in here. It may be greater than five branches in Brooklyn, we do not care. This where clause returns true as long as there is some branch in Brooklyn which satisfies this. Even if there are five, it will satisfy only once. The where clause is satisfied for this tuple. So, each tuple in branch will get output in the result only once. And since branch name is a primary key in our schema, there is no need to eliminate duplicates. There are no duplicates. So, if I were writing this query, I would definitely use the second form, not the first form. So, in fact, there are several forms, greater than some, greater than all and so forth. So, just in formal mathematical notation, 
uh, f some comparison less than greater than some and then the right side is a set of values a relation is equivalent to there is some tuple in this relation such that the comparison holds for between f the left hand side and that particular tuple so it can be any of these comparisons less than greater than and so forth so less than some uh, 5 less than sum of 0 5 is false because it's equal to but it's not less than 5 uh, whereas for 5 less than sum on this this is not actual sql syntax this is just conceptually what you are doing this is a set so this is true 5 not equal to sum here is true because there is a value 0 yes which is not equal it's not equal okay so equal to sum is actually the same as in okay cuz equal to sum means 5 equal to sum in this will be true as long as 5 is over here so that's the same as this value in this um, not equal to sum is not the same as not in <laughs> be careful about this so uh, is it true that 5 not equal to sum over here yeah because it's not equal to 0 however uh, 5 not in uh, this will be false because 5 is in this so here is another query which says find names of all branches that have greater assets than all branches located in Brooklyn so now instead of sum we say greater than all okay this query clear it's the same as before except we use all instead of sum it has to be true for every tuple. So you look at every branch in Brooklyn, make sure that the assets is greater than every branch in Brooklyn. Okay? But for all you have to be a bit careful. What if there is no branch in Brooklyn? What if this everything will satisfy? Okay. So the uh, just like we saw for some, the all thing is defined. I'll skip it. It's uh, sort of similar. Uh, not equal to all is the same as not in it turns out because it should not be equal to every one of those uh, but equal to all is obviously not the same as in it must be equal to every one of those which is a very silly thing and these are other examples ok now there are a bunch of other constructs so we have seen in not in less than some less than all and, uh, there is also exists and not exists these test if the subquery is has some result or is empty okay so here is an example query um, this is again a same query could have been written in a simpler way from earlier uh, but now we are going to write it differently it's actually a little confusing so let me show this customers who have an account at all branches located in Brooklyn so customers we get name we get from depositor as before in our uh, exercise schema to get the customer name we actually have to join customer with depositor on customer id so you have to equate customer IDs. here the customer name is directly available in depositor so we are we can be a bit lazy here so now uh, we are looking for that so we want to find customers who have an account at all branches located in Brooklyn. So how do you ensure this that they have an account at all branches in Brooklyn? The for all con, you know conceptual notion like this in some cases you you know if you say uh, you, you can't say quite equal to all and so on. So that previous construct less than all greater than all doesn't work here. But you can represent it as follows if there is some branch in Brooklyn where this person does not have an account this person should be eliminated that is the idea so you have a double negative so uh, is so the for all clause here like has an account in all branches turns into a double negative sort of thing there should not be a branch where this person does not have an account so how do you find branches where this in this case branches in Brooklyn where this person does not have an account well that is this subquery uh, everything from here to here is this subquery and what is it doing first of all you select branch name 
from branch where branch city is Brooklyn. So these are all the branches at Brooklyn, except those branches where this guy has an account. No, no. This part is branches where S has an account. So how do you know uh, where S has an account? This is interesting. So first of all, uh, we have to uh, join depositor account to get um, branch name uh, on join it on account number t dot account number equal to r dot account number. Um, but there is more. Uh, we need the customer name to be the same as this guy. This guy should, we want to find where all this person has an account. Okay, so the depositor relation has account number and customer name, uh, whereas the account relation has branch name and account number. So we have to join these two. We have to join depositor and account to make this happen. But we want to restrict it to this particular customer. So now note something interesting is happening. We said depositor as S. Then in this subquery, we are referring to S dot customer name. So we are saying S dot customer name equal to T dot customer name. T is the depositor tuple. So what is happening here? We are using a tuple variable from the outer level query. This is the outer level query. And this is called a nested query because it is nested inside that. So we are using a variable from the outer query in the inner query or the nested query. This kind of variable is called a correlation variable. So you, you can uh, give, it a, uh, give this depositor name S and then use S inside here. You can't do it the other way. You can't use T outside. The scope of T is only in the nested query. But the scope of S is, yeah, it is in, in, it includes its subqueries. If this guy, it's perfectly possible for you, this guy to have a subquery. So T will be visible in its subquery. So you can have nested scope. So what we are doing is using this selection uh, condition, where condition, S dot customer name equal to T dot customer name to restrict this to accounts belonging to this particular S. So think of the execution as follows. You uh, do the from clause here. Um, and for each depositor S in this from class, if there were multiple things in there, you will take the cross product. And for every combination, you will check this where clause. And when you execute the where clause, you actually have to execute these subqueries. So this subquery you can execute and it gets a set of branch names. This subquery you execute. But now the customer name is fixed because you're doing it for one particular depositor tuple. So the customer name is fixed. So this guy is going to give you only branches where that particular customer has an account. So now the except does what? It will check if there is some branch in Brooklyn. If there is some branch in Brooklyn where this person does not have an account, that will be there in the except result. If this person has an account at every branch in Brooklyn, the result of this except is going to be empty. Now what is this where clause doing? It says where not exists this thing. Where here? Uh, unfortunately, it will clash with this depositor. That's why we have, you can otherwise, if the names are unique, you can use it. But here, to avoid the clash, we call that S and T. Okay, so now what is going to happen? If a depositor has an account at every branch in Brooklyn, this except clause will give an empty result. And then the not exists will return true. And therefore, the customer will get output. But if the particular uh, person uh, does not have an account at some particular branch in Brooklyn, then that will not get removed by the except. Then the not exists will fail. And so that customer will not come in the output a little convoluted, but if you need to write such queries, unfortunately, you have to write it like this in SQL. It's not very common that you typically don't write such query, but once in a way, you may come across such things, and this is how you write it. So here's another query. Um, customers who have at least 
two accounts. Uh, so here we are finding customer name by joining these things, where the branch name is Perry Ridge. Um, but there's an extra condition. Again, this is a correlation variable. T dot customer name equal to R dot customer name. So we are finding um, th this will return one occurrence of customer name for every account that this customer has in Powai. And now, if you say it's not unique, that means the customer has two or more accounts in Powai. And uh, so these are the customers that we want. Customers who have at least two accounts in, uh, sorry, this is Perry Ridge. So, so far we have looked at subqueries in the where clause. You can also have subqueries in the from clause. They are not actually, technically they are not called subqueries, they are called derived relations. But it's, it's a basic thing is very similar. So, here is an example where we are uh, doing the following. In the from clause, we have this query. Um, here, this parenthesis ends here. So, the subquery inside the from clause says, select branch name average balance from account group by branch name. We have seen this query before. For every branch, what is the average? So, that is the subquery and now we are renaming it. We are saying as branch average open bracket branch name comma average branch. So, this is a variant of the as clause which lets you give a name to the table and to the attributes in there. So, this attribute does not have a name whereas we are giving it a name average balance here. Okay. So, now um, you have effectively this this whole subquery is conceptually is executed to give you this relation branch average and now this query says where average balance greater than 1200. Does this query look familiar? We saw it before, right? How did we write it last time? Yeah, we use the having clause. Now, with this construct, you do not need the having clause. You can always take that, put it as a subquery, and then have a where clause here, which looks at this. Uh, having clause is not essential, although obviously for some queries it is easier to write it using this query would be easier to write using the having clause than this way. But this is more general. You can write even more complex queries using this, which you cannot write with a single having clause. I think this is the last topic for the day, which is null values. Um, it is possible for uh, attribute of a tuple to be to have the special value null. In fact, SQL is what is null? It basically is a value that does not exist. The special value that indicates I do not know this value or the value does not exist. The actual interpretation depends on the particular schema and the, uh, you know, the designer. It could mean any of these. It could mean when you say phone number is null for a customer, does it mean the customer does not have a phone number? It might. It might also mean that you do not know what the phone number is. The customer may or may not have a phone number. But the actual value null is a well defined value in SQL. What it means is up to you, the designer. Now, unknown values are always a problem. So, how do you deal with unknown values typically? In COBOL, what do you do for unknown values? If a phone number is unknown, what do you store? Space. Zeros. Huh? So, okay, so she will store zeros, you will store spaces, somebody else might store 9999. Okay, each of you has your own convention for it. Now, you do not know. When you look at a value, is it unknown? I do not know. Maybe 0 is a valid phone number. I mean, I may have the domain knowledge to know that 0 is not a valid phone number. But in some other domain where which I do not understand, it may be hard to tell whether this is a valid value or it is really an unknown value. Null is a much better way of doing it. COBOL does not have null as far as I know, right? SQL, this is one of the nice things about SQL. Null is a value. In fact, every type allows null. Um, integers allows nulls floating points allows nulls, character allows nulls, everything allows nulls as a special value. Now, in uh, if you use C or Java, you know that there is a null value there, but the null value is available only for certain object types, but for integers and floating point, you, there is no equivalent of null in those languages. In SQL, every type allows a null. 
So, uh, this unlikely to occur can be dangerous. So, in our uh, Fox Pro database earlier, um, the retirement age, you know, it was there in some manual record, but the people who built the database didn't have it immediately available. So, they just stored a value unknown. But what is the unknown value they stored? This was built in the 80s. So, 1999 looked like a long way off. So, in fact, they uh, stored only two digits for the year. They stored 99. So, all retirement dates were 99. And guess what? Y2K came along and everybody would be fired from IIT. <laughs> so, we had to scramble and uh, change that to, first of all, a four-digit year and then uh, set it to some, some other date in the future. <laughs> Subsequently, it was made the actual retirement date. So, I think now the data is correct. Um, but yeah, it was, at least a null value would have been better if it, it was not available in that system, just like in COBOL. Fox Pro did not have it, but SQL has it. Any questions? So, now how do you deal with null values? How do you store it? How do you check if it is null? Um, so, the predicate is null can be used to check for null values. You cannot say equal to null. Yeah, it allows that. Hmm? No. Even if we do not provide value, it shows null. Yeah, if you. This is a SQL database, right? I mean, it's a feature of the language, and the database supports it. So, when you want to see if something is null, you should not say equal to null because of the way comparison with null is defined. I'll cover that in the next few slides. But if you want to check if a value is null, you should say value or whatever r dot a is null. Okay? So, for example, select loan number from loan where amount is null. That will tell you loans where the amount is null. That is probably an error situation. It should not be null. Now, if, if you use our uh, tab create table, um, if we declared loan to be uh, amount to be not null, this cannot happen. The database guarantees it. If you f did not declare it, it may happen. Then you can run this query to check. So, nulls introduce a lot of issues. What if I say amount plus 5 and amount happens to be null? What is the result? Yes, null. Okay. So, that is how SQL defines it. Now, what about aggregates? Um, if I say sum of amount from loan and the uh, amounts were 2, 4 and null, uh, what would sum be? It ignores the null. And Just ignores the null and makes it 6. What about average? It ignores the null. Therefore, you add 2, 4 and divide by 2, not by 3. So, it does not treat nulls as 0. If you just take sum, it appears that null is treated as 0. But that is not the case. When you see average, it becomes more clear that null is thrown out before you compute the aggregate. Now, what if the group has only null as a value? All the values are null in the group. Then what is sum? Null. Average, null. Okay. Um, so, all the aggregate operations except count star uh, ignore the null value when they aggregate. So, you are aggregating on some value. If it is a null value, it just ignores it. Count star is separate in that it counts nulls also. It counts the total number of tuples in effect. It, whether the value is null or not is irrelevant. Is only the count star or when we do count say some particular attribute? If you say a count of uh, uh, let us say amount, if it is null, it is eliminated. It is eliminated. It is eliminated. Only count star which is going to count the null tuple also. Yes. So, now this was um, arithmetic and aggregation with nulls. What about comparison of a tuple? If you do not have a primary key declaration, you do not declare anything to be not null, yeah, sure. It is a pretty useless tuple. Yes, it would. It will count it. Count star will count it. 
means this is probably an error situation, it should not, <laughs> there is no reason to store such a tuple, but if you do counts are well counted. Uh, good question, I am glad you are asking these questions, you are really probing into SQL. <laughs> okay, so, we saw arithmetic and aggregation in nulls, what about comparison, this is important. What if you, well you would not say 5 less than null, but if you have, um, go, go back here and take this query and say select loan number from loan where amount less than 5. What is the amount is null? What should you do? It should not be considered, right? So, can we assume it to be false? Okay. It is not known actually. So, yeah. What to do? So, in fact, it is a little tricky. Um, you, so, here is an example. So, you should treat it not as false, but as unknown. And the reason is you can have double negation. Uh, multiple levels of negation, which will get you into trouble. So, take this query. Supposing you say 5 less than a, where a happens to be null. a is an attribute name used in uh, where clause. If a happens to be null, if you treat 5 less than a to be false, then what happens to not of 5 less than a? It becomes true, which is silly. a is null. You should not say that not of 5 less than a is true. So, what you do is, any comparison with null returns a special value called unknown. It does not return true or false, it returns unknown. So, that you can carry through, through and or and so on. So, what is and uh, if of a true and unknown? So, let us say the and has two parts, one evaluates to true, the other part evaluates to unknown. What should the result be? And unknown. Will be and will be unknown. Or, or true of true. or and unknown or of true, true and unknown, well, true. It does not matter what this unknown is, whether the unknown is true or false, does not matter. The other one is true, so the result of the or will be true. What we end up having is what is called a three valued logic, where you define the results of all the Boolean operation and or not on these three values. The results on true and false are already known, so we only have to define the result on unknown. So, or of unknown and true is true as you can see here um, or of unknown and false. So, unknown or false is what is it? It is unknown okay, because it if this value were true, it would be true. If the unknown were false, it would be false. So, we do not know it remains unknown. Similarly, unknown or unknown is unknown. Uh, unknown. It, unknown means it we do not know whether it is true or false and is interesting. So, it is a complement, it is opposite of or. So, true and unknown is unknown. However, false and unknown is definitely false. So, regardless of whether this is true or false, this will be false. Similarly, unknown and unknown is unknown and not of unknown is unknown. And the special is unknown evaluates to true if p evaluates to unknown. So, is unknown is a special clause. Okay? So, all this is fine, but now what do we do? So, we have a where clause, we had a null value, the null value resulted in an unknown truth value, the where clause had and or not operations. So, you sort of push it through all those and the final result can be true, false or unknown. If it is true, what happens? The tuple is output. If it is false, the tuple is not output. If it is unknown, we do not know whether to output the tuple or not. At this point, you cannot carry it any further, you have to make a call. So, we sort of postpone the decision on whether it is true or false, but now you have to make a call, you cannot postpone. So, at this point, uh, you have to make a decision. So, SQL makes a decision that uh, if the ultimately the entire wire clause evaluates to unknown, that tuple will not appear in the result. So, at that point, unknown is treated the same as false at the end of evaluating the entire wire clause, but inside of it, it is kept as unknown. So, that avoids this this kind of problem, not of 5 less than a and being different from 5 less than a, 5 greater than a, greater than equal to a. So, if, if you without the unknown, not of 5 less than a would not be equal to 
5 greater than or equal to. You expect them to be the same, but because of nulls it would give different meanings. So, as I said, result of bad clause is treated as false if it evaluates to unknown at the very last step. Okay. So, that ends what I wanted to cover today.